Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Friendship News Hour presented to you by Bummer Dude Media. Today is May the 10th, 2021. My name is Frank Huerta, and I'm joined by Alex Kenzie. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. How was your uh, Mother's Day weekend? It was cool, man. Mother's Day weekend was cool. Um, yeah, I didn't do much, man. Chilled, relaxed, had a good time uh, not doing very much at all. Took a walk on Saturday. It's what we do now, me and my girlfriend. We walk. It's great. <laughs> That's what we do. We just will get up on a Saturday morning, make some coffee, yeah. and like, hey, you want to go get some breakfast? And all the greatest things in San Diego are like a 30 minute walk or, or less. Mm. So we just get breakfast and then we just keep walking and we just do everything on foot. It's fantastic. That's what's up. You guys like run together too sometimes, right? Every now and then she runs at the same time I run. I wouldn't say we run together. Got you. Okay. It's usually separated within about the first 30 seconds or so. <laughs> Love you, babe. Um, how was yours? Your mom was in town. Yeah. Good, man. Yeah, my mom came in town, and uh, it, was, it was cool. We went to a farmer's market on Saturday, the, the one that uh, I went to last weekend. We took her over there, and, and she loves that kind of stuff. So we, we took her there and uh, just just hung out, man. Yesterday, we, we went over to Sarah's family. We are just kind of all together with uh, our nieces and, like, all the family and just, just hanging, and, and it, was, it was awesome. It was, family time is the best, man, especially since, like, I don't live with – my family, like in the same city as my family, it's always nice. Like when they come here, I get to go home. Like really makes me appreciate family time. So it's great. Cool. Uh, today's May 10th. Uh, my sister's birthday. So happy mm -hmm. birthday, Sarah. We love you. Her and her husband are in uh, upstate New York with their little baby. Cutest little family there ever was. Um, you know, I thought it was a slow news weekend. And it turns out it was a pretty uh, not slow news weekend. I guess I just wasn't paying attention. A lot going on. Um, but before we get to the news of the weekend, we need to get to some very important news of our own, some very exciting personal news for the Friendship News Hour. Uh, we have our first sponsor. Very excited. Very excited. Um, Frank, I got a question for you, man. Shoot. What do you want to support veterans and first responders while drinking the world's smoothest coffee? I'm all for it. You're into those things? Me too. Me too. Uh, the Friendship News Hour is proud to announce our brand new sponsorship with Gun Barrel Coffee. They are local here in the uh, they're in the in Batavia. They're in like my my neck of the woods. Um, they are they're a really cool coffee company. Uh, I found them just at a local flea market. Uh, well, not it's a, when I say flea market, it's like the biggest garage sale you can ever think of. Um, it's amazing. But I found them there. I tried the coffee. I was blown away by it. And I was like, man, I would love to work with these guys. Uh, not only because the coffee is amazing. Uh, the thing that really resonated with us is that Gun Barrel Coffee donates $1 from every item purchased to veteran and first responder charities all over the country. Uh, from their light blend to their double dark roast, which is the battleship roast. All their coffees are very smooth without the acid or the bitterness. Uh, I myself have been drinking the Moab brew, which is the mother of all beans. I love the name, uh, but it's their extra caffeine roast. And it's, it perked me right up, man. It, it, it gets me going right in the morning. I love it. Yeah. Gun barrel is great. Um, Sal, Brian and Michael have uh, done a good job of uh, turning this hobby uh, into a uh, home roasted in, uh, endeavor. We love, uh, Small business, we love entrepreneurship, uh, not to mention uh, small business uh, co-owned by a uh, U.S. Army veteran in Sal. And uh, shoot, man, guns and coffee and freedom in America. That's, uh, that's what I like in, in my uh, small coffee roasters, and that's who Gun Barrel is. Uh, and like Al said, they are proud to donate a portion of their proceeds to organizations that support those who serve and those who protect and the defenders of our rights and freedoms. So uh, good coffee for a good cause. And uh, they were uh, generous enough to extend uh, Friendship News Hour listeners with a promo code. Yes. So they offer 14 different blends and roasts and you can get it in a whole bean ground or like single serve K cups. So what, however you drink it, they got it for you. 
Uh, right now, if you use the code FNH10, you'll save 10% at gunbarrelcoffee.com. Definitely go check them out. We're super appreciative, super honored that they wanted to work with us. Uh, very, very excited. Uh, but Gun Barrel Coffee, damn good coffee, damn good cause. It's damn right. Um, so today we're, uh, we got to start with this pipeline shutdown. Uh, there was a hack over the weekend that uh, it got into Colonial Pipeline. I never heard of them, but they provide almost 50% of the diesel and gasoline on the eastern seaboard. So they start in northern New Jersey, just south of New York, and the pipeline runs all the way down the eastern seaboard into uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and then into Texas. So um, there was a hack on their uh, main pipeline and it was a ransomware hack so if you're unfamiliar with ransomware what that does what that can do uh, essentially it's a virus that gets into your computer system and it doesn't allow you to perform any functions until a ransom is paid so it's basically taking your system hostage for money usually bitcoin or some other form of untraceable cryptocurrency and this in and of its own is a really uh concerning story it's very much you know, um, modern warfare, modern guerrilla warfare um, that doesn't involve anything but a room full of computers and very competent people that know how to use them. So it, uh, on more than one front, it's concerning. But the most concerning thing, the most concerning aspect of this hack over this past weekend is not the hack in and of itself, is that this is not a new story, not even in the least. And we're going to break down for you just a small sample size of stories just like this that show, number one, how vulnerable we are as a, as a modern, as modern nations who rely on these grids and these computers to run our lives. Um, and just how easy it's been for these systems to be uh, infiltrated and manipulated. Um, December 30th, 2016, there's a cyber attack in the Ukraine. And this is about the biggest one that we've seen, to my knowledge, at least in the last five or six years. So Russia was responsible for this one. It wasn't, there wasn't any ambiguity with that. It was, it was Russia that infiltrated this um, electrical utility in Ukraine. And one second. So this is how they do it. They get into the system and people have no idea that they're there, right? They're, they're not immediately malicious. They're very casual in their appearance on, uh, on a computer system that they're hacking. And they do that so that they can learn the system. They can gradually get into somebody's computer, usually through an email that's sent where somebody clicks on a link that they're not supposed to, uh, somebody enables macros on an Excel sheet they're not supposed to, and then boom, the hackers are in. Now, they're not in there doing anything crazy just yet. Like I said, they're just trying to learn. So uh, in, this, in this instance here in Ukraine, for nine months, these hackers studied the system. And when they finally decided to attack on December 23rd, 2015, they took control of three of Ukraine's 30 power distribution utilities within a half an hour. <laughs> During the attack, the first time the power systems had been blacked out through cyber means, control room engineers sat helplessly as ghostly hands moved cursors across their computer screens, opening circuit breakers at 50 substations and shutting off electricity to about 700,000 people. So this is in Ukraine. And if you're into geopolitics at all, you understand that Ukraine and Russia uh, and the sovereignty of Ukraine is more or less under threat all the time. It's not surprising that this happened, but it was definitely alarming. Um, and it's alarming because there was a cyber campaign in the United States in 2014 that resulted in 17 companies, systems being penetrated, including four electrical utilities. So this is, you know, we're starting to learn that we're vulnerable in these places that control our day-to-day, -day, right? If you wanted to screw, if you really wanted to screw with a country, if you wanted to act maliciously and attack a country without attacking a country. And the best way to do that is through 
throw a stick in the spokes of the wheels that turn our society, our water, our electricity, our gas, you know, all these things that run in the background that we take for granted. Uh, we now learned in 2014 that those things are incredibly vulnerable to attack from foreign nations and bad actors around the world. So fast forward to July 23, 2018, Russian hackers reach U.S. utility control rooms and they claimed hundreds of victims in a uh, long-running campaign that put them inside the control rooms of U.S. electric utilities where they could have caused blackouts. And they believe that these campaigns are likely continuing. Um, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, said that they've been intruding into our networks and are positioning themselves for a limited or widespread attack. And he went as far as to say they're waging a covert war on the West. And um, again, it, it mirrored this Ukraine attack because they were in there to just absorb information showing how our utility networks were configured. And learning the equipment, learning how it was used, they take this information and they build a case so that they can really attack if and when they need to. But the point here is that nobody knew that they were in there for a very long time and they didn't do anything malicious. So they could have been in the weeds for longer than we known and more than likely they were there after without being found out. Fast forward again, November 24th, 2019. Utilities targeted in cyber attacks and they were identified. More than a dozen U.S. Utilities, utilities that were targeted in a recent wave of cyber attacks have been identified. Some of these utilities, most of which are relatively small, are located near dams, locks, and other critical infrastructure. Uh, some of these being Cloverland Electric Co uh, Cooperative in Michigan, which stands uh, next to the St. Marie Locks, a critical juncture for transportation of iron ore into U.S. steel mills, uh, a public utility in Washington State, um, where that controls major federal dams and transmission lines and an electric power cooperative in North Dakota. One of the few utilities that's capable of delivering electricity to both uh, Eastern and Western grids of the nation. All right. So for where are we at now? 2019, five years, we're knowing that we're vulnerable and that we're being hacked. Um, February 24th, 2020. An alert from the Department of Homeland Security said that cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency described as a, a ransomware attack on an unnamed natural gas pipeline operator that halted operations for two days while staff shut down and then restored systems. So they're just fucking with us, constantly just poking us to see what they can do. They're in our utilities. I'm not being an alarmist. I'm not raising the, the flag on any one person or country. This isn't just dedicated to Russia. This is dedicated to the vulnerability of our utilities. They're here and they're messing with our systems. Just this past year, February 8th, 2021, the water treatment plant in Oldsmore, Florida was hacked and the intruder briefly increased the amount of lye used to treat water to a dangerous level. Now, luckily there's alarms on these things. So when something like that happens, that alarm triggers, we know what's happening. We can stop it immediately. And that's exactly what happened. The problem here again, these hackers were in this system in Florida for a surprisingly long time, months and months and months and months and months without going detected. So every day they're able to sit and look at these systems, learn them, learn the equipment, learn the schedules, learn the passwords, learn the logins, and they can do whatever they want. On top of how dangerous this could have been, this treatment plant supplies water to Tampa Bay, Florida, and they decided to launch their attack the weekend of the Super Bowl. So you have famous athletes and politicians and celebrities and anybody who's anybody going to Florida for the Super Bowl and the water that they're showering in in their hotel or they're drinking in at the restaurant was trying was attempted to be poisoned. 
And then this weekend, this Colonial Pipeline hack shut down half of our Eastern seaboard supply of gas and diesel. So, I mean, it's like that, it's like that uh, boiling frog metaphor. You know which one I'm talking about? I don't. You don't boil a frog. If you put a frog in boiling water, it's going to jump right out. But if you put a frog in lukewarm water and you turn it up gradually and you'll boil it for the frog will boil before it even knows it's dead. It's the same thing. We're just sitting in water that's gradually being turned up slowly, but surely. And we are very vulnerable in the places that are our weakest. How do I want to say that? That we need to be protecting the most and that we take for granted and we don't understand how they work normal citizens, you and I, it takes a very specialized person to understand these systems and our adversaries know them as well or better than we do. How is that not an act of war? Like if we know Russia is doing something like that, like how is that not, you're, you're attacking like water supply, you're attacking electric, like that seems like an attack on, on the American people almost. Like I, I know this one was done. I think the group's called dark side, right? From this past uh, week. Uh, what's it called here? It's a criminal group that's based in Eastern Europe. Um, yeah, Dark Side. And it doesn't have any known formal or informal ties. Sure. But like uh-huh. in the case of Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine's our ally, is it not? I, I know Russia kind of is yes. too. Yes. Russia's not our ally. When when out when when Russia comes out and openly admits to doing something like this, like how is that not perceived? They don't, as they don't admit to it. They deny it. They deny it full bore. It, it's our intelligence that lets us know who did it, and right. and where. No, they're 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 not. You, no, no way. If they went out and claimed responsibility for this attack, there would be instant sanctions and uh, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of punishments for for Russia. You would hope if they. Mm-hmm outwardly claimed yeah we're doing this we're in there and um we're not going to stop but that's what they're saying in so many words right right and yeah i mean it is it it it, it is it's covert warfare it's guerrilla warfare you'd be using computers and hackers and um you know non-lethal weapons to slowly chip away at our infrastructure and um I don't know. I might come off as cynical in this show. Um, I hope that it's not always, you know, brimstone and fire and despair and, you know, hair on fire, the world's on fire kind of thing. I, I, you know, it's not that, but I can't help but think of the current complacent climate that surrounds America, particularly when it comes to, um, our youth and how we tolerate the shit that is our education system and how we don't put a focus on making sure that the fundamentals are taught correctly before anything else. Because when you become complacent, it's things like this that can go by and nobody really cares. I mean, you don't hear a lot of people talking about this. And when it comes in spurts like this, it's more of like a, oh, you know, red flag. We should look at this. We should take keep an eye on this. But I don't think anybody's saying what it is. It's covert warfare. It's 100% malicious action against the United States and its infrastructure. And it should be a much bigger deal. I mean, it should be something that a lot more people are talking about and raising an issue about, I think. No, oh, yeah, for sure. And, it, and from what I read, it sounds like they're not even like doing this to attack us necessarily. It sounds like they just want money in this case, like these guys in this scenario. Uh, it said Dark Side like it wasn't here like to cause chaos necessarily. Like they're what they do is like ex- they like engage in this extortion, um, threaten to like either publicly leak data or or you know try to take these companies down. They hold it over these companies' head that we're going to leak this data that's super important, super private. Or in this case, shut down an entire water supply to all these people. And it's it's like they have all the power at that point, I would think, to get what they want. But it's like, how does that happen? Like, how are we hacked 
how is a water treat water treatment facility? Is that what this was? No, this this was a, a gas pipeline. But I mean, I, I don't know. I can I can see it. I think anybody that works for any sort of large corporation knows that you, you're getting inundated with emails that sometimes look weird, look a little fishy. Um and sometimes it's clever, you know, sometimes they get you, it, it's from like your CEO or something, you know, they use your CEO's name or they use a manager's name or they use something relevant to where you'd click on it and then right. boom, once you click on it, they're in. Yeah. And it takes more work from that point to get to where they need to go, but they're in and they, now they can just swim around and they can do what they want to do. And it doesn't even have to be malicious. They can, they could be very covert about it as they're gaining information and that's where the power comes from right the information they can hold that information over the head of this company by you know i know a lot of people who would love to love to see this information go public so what's it going to be yeah and that's terrifying it's terrifying it's terrifying to learn after the fact that your water supply had attempted to be poisoned and like thank god there's a control for that but what if there, you know, what if there wasn't, or what if it seemed normal, or what if somebody else was in on it on the inside? You know, it is any number of variables. You could say what if, and then all of the sudden, an entire city's water supply is tainted. And then, like, you know, I'm not wishing that on anybody, but you got to imagine that if that's the case, if that's what would have happened, then, you know, people are making a much bigger stink about it because now it, you know, it, it it's home, it's here, our, our defenses are you know, lack thereof actually did their job. Um, but I think to get to that point, even to get to that point, you're, you're in, you're in deep trouble. You're, you're, you're in deep water. I'd have to assume that like gas prices went way up this weekend. Then, Oh yeah. On the whole... And they're going to continue to go up, particularly in the States where this supply was, was choked. Um, Is it still off? It's still off. It's it's um, it's estimated to be off probably the whole week. But you know, we used to be the number one uh, producer of oil in the country there for uh, four years between 2017 and 2021, and this would have not been an issue at all. But we've ceased all production of oil, so this mm-hmm. we're now very reliant on this kind of supply, and um, yeah. Not good. Not I good. Expect. It's expected to hit the pumps for sure. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Well, hopefully uh, we start taking steps to actually secure these kind of facilities because that seems like a no-brainer to me. That that seems like something that is a national security risk. A, <laughs> I mean, that, that's exactly what it is. It's a national security risk. Yeah, like, and it's also all the electricity like imagine if if they shut down electricity in a plant or or like set off like an emp that that wiped out most our country or whatever like think of what what the country would do without water electricity you know that that, there'd be mass hysteria yeah that's when the shooting starts because we're not far from that right now but you you take away the things that we've taken for granted and that we expect to have every single day in mass yeah yeah it's going to be it's going to be hell and I, and I think our adversaries are very well aware of that. They're using that to their advantage, 100%. Um, and, it, you know, I think it's, again, if you've ever worked in a corporation or a small business, right, that's even a better example. And they've been doing things for 15 years the same way, and it's running the ship, and they're making money every year, so they have no incentive, incentive to change. And so they're going to continue to run on Windows XP because it works, right? Gas stations run on, on Windows XP, some of them. They're having to upgrade now, and it costs a lot of money to do because they've, they've missed the boat on however many years of innovation, and they're continuing to just upgrade software on, on Windows XP. But it's not, not nearly as secure as what's coming out today. So, you know, I can, I can just see it now. I can see some, somebody in management who is not willing to take their employees through a technology shift because they're busy. Everyone's busy. They have a ton on their plate. They don't want to get anything like that going. So they just push it off and they push it off and they push it off and they don't have any real idea of the, the risk that they're taking to do that until something like this happens. 
And so I, I, I'm not necessarily surprised. And that's what makes me cynical is that I'm not surprised to see something like this. I see this article and I said, well, of course, because why would we, you know, why would we do the smart, rational uh, thing? But like you said, hopefully, hopefully, you know, if you want to be in this business in the future, there's going to be some sort of regulation where, you know, you, you don't have a choice. You have to, your, I, your IT uh, needs to be as robust as anybody else's. I'd like to see a shift towards Apple being the main computer used in most of these systems too, man, because they're way more secure with information. It's still hackable, not nearly as hackable as a Windows computer, though. Yeah. A, so it's like I, 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 I see it in everywhere, like all networks and all businesses. And, and like you're saying with, with the gas, gasoline stations, they're all based on Windows because it's easy to manipulate. It's easy like to set up the architecture that you want. Like that's, that's the idea of it. You can make a PC do what you want it to do. But there's a lot of risks that come with that too. And, and it seems like it has, it's been exposed, you know, yeah. very, very many times. And it, it, yes, you can still hack a Mac, but it's a lot, lot harder. So I, I, I'm always surprised that Mac has never, or Apple has never tried to push more into that, that network kind of thing. But I'm sure there's some reason that I just don't know about. You remember that story? Um, it wasn't too long ago, probably like 2018. And uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook came out and he said um, um, he doesn't like the idea of children using sh- social media. Yeah. Do you remember this story at all? Yes. Yeah. He, he, I think he, he visited a, a college in London and he was like, look, I don't have kids, but I got a nephew. And I am saying don't get on any of this stuff. Um, there's been a bunch of these stories, man. Um, there was a Facebook exec uh, probably around the same time, right around 2018. Um, and they were like, don't let any of your kids on there. Make sure that they don't go on at all. It There's unintended consequences that are destroying how society works. Um, and there was a, a story over the weekend that um, that Facebook owner, Insta, uh, or, excuse me, Instagram owner Facebook has been for a while planning on an Instagram for children. You believe that? Like super, super locked down. <sighs> that I don't know. Man. It is. So I guess the, I guess the, the regulations of Instagram are that you can't have an Instagram until you're 13. So that's, that's the limit there. Um, but their, their rationale for getting this Instagram for kids going is that the kids manipulate their age anyway. And they were like, we know as much. You know, we're not dumb. We know that's happening. So their thought was, well, why don't we just create a platform for them? And attorneys general from 44 states and territories, basically the entire United States got together and and they urged Facebook to abandon these plans immediately. Citing behavioral and privacy concerns about social media's effects on young people. I think that they're what they're saying is, hey, you are creating a database of children, you sick bucks. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. (laughs) Are you kidding me? You're creating a database of, of social media for children under the age of 13. Are you kidding me? Yeah, then you just get some like 40 year old dude, like, yeah, I'm a 12 year old boy. I'm going to make. Christ yeah. Almighty! I mean, it's just, <laughs> and That's, like you said, I don't, I don't think we know exactly how they intended for this platform to work. But like, come on, how could you not see this coming? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm curious how that works though, like for kids, because I don't think I had a Facebook until I had like a MySpace when I was like 14, I think 14 or 15. My mom found it, got pissed, made me delete it. Then I didn't have a Facebook till I was like 16. But like, I wonder how it works today. Like, could a kid that's 10 make an Instagram or a Facebook that says that they're, I mean, I'm sure they could make it and says that they're older than they are and still oh, get yeah. on. That's stuff. what they, that, that, that's what they said. The, their rationale for creating something like this is because they know kids fabricate their age. They, they don't tell the truth that they want to get on. So they're like, well, why don't we just cut the shit and make one for them that they could enjoy and use? I mean, I guess it's an innocent enough idea, but I, I, I th- also, if you look at it bigger picture, just like, yeah, like, like, do you want to 
have your kids on Instagram at all at the age of eight, regardless if they're just connecting with their friends or not. Have you ever seen that social dilemma movie on Netflix? Uh, I watched like half of it and fell asleep, but yeah, oh, like, really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was all right. It was just like long and dry to me. Yeah. Well, for sure. I, I think it was trying to be like, uh, you know, shocking on yeah. how the, but it, it, you know, it just brought up a ton of points about like the, the ails of it, especially with un, undeveloped minds. So I, I agree with it on both fronts. If you're trying, if you're trying to like protect children from predators online, then the first start is not to create a children's Instagram. And then if you really have concerns about social media and the way that it affects society particularly children and i agree with that a thousand percent then yeah i a hundred percent do not do this at all it doesn't that make you just like feel icky to just think about a children's social media network yeah it just makes me think about all the things that could go wrong go play play, play soccer or something you know all right instagram i hate no way we're going to start to see the effects of that, though, because like our generation just missed it. But like the generations that followed from us were the first that were like fully integrated into this, like tablets, more video games, like e easier ac access to all this stuff. Where so is I feel like our generation was the last generation that like really played outside and like did other shit like like this was like a supplement. Yeah, yeah. Like I still watch TV. Like I remember watching Rugrats, Power Rangers, all that kind of stuff. But like, I, I didn't have like a tablet, like a mini TV that I could hold in front of me and like sit there and watch that stuff. Or like all these different avenues to like basically like turn your brain off and just like watch a screen, so your parents don't have to like necessarily parent as much. Yeah, right? for sure, man. And I remember how addicting it was when it came yeah. out. Oh yeah, you know? I would go <laughs> down to the local. I, I didn't have. Let's see. I didn't have non dial up internet until I was probably 15. Yeah. And I used to go down to the local library when I knew my mom was going to be on a long phone call or some shit and I couldn't use the internet. So I'd go down there and get on AIM or get on MySpace. And dude, I was addicted. I loved it. that, that like dopamine hit on likes and on people liking your pictures and you finding new people or, or discovering who Tila Tequila was or whatever it was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was cool. But also I remember that like people used to be shamed for like oversharing or being petty or, you know, doing, cause I think back then it was still the prevalent thought that online wasn't real life. Yeah. You know so what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah. It was, it was an, another place to go. It wasn't, it didn't mirror. And I still don't think it mirrors real life. I, I don't, I think a lot of people use Twitter as like the baseline, like pulse, if you will, of what's going I think that's completely false. Do you know, it's like some ridiculously small amount of people who are actually on Twitter. Um, ah, it's like all like of, the, of like the population, but it's also like dense in um, influential people. You know, mm. anybody's anybody has you know more or less has a Twitter and it's verified. It's got the blue check mark and all that. Um, yeah, it's easy to put your message out without having to run it through whoever you know all these different people to approve it and blah 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 blah. Like if you wanted to put out a press release or something, like right? And that's shifted. That 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 mode of thinking is shifted from when we were kids and we were playing around on MySpace or even when Facebook was first coming in. You know, like we would just uh, like we would just put what we were doing at that time. You know, it was so like raw and and un unfinished product of social media. But I think the difference between now and then is that now a lot more people buy into the idea that that is real life yeah and then you like on instagram you have all these like unreal portrayals of like what people are and it's fucking half of its filters and photoshop images and stuff it's like not it's not real at all <laughs> it's just all like bullshit yeah dude 100 percent. and I, but, I was an impressionable child you know yeah. i was very much about the status about 
name brand this and um you know what all of that meant for like who you are and your place in the world that to me meant a lot and i don't i don't think social media helped any of that um i think i was just thankful enough to grow out of it and to you know more or less learn what was important in life as i grew as i grew older and i think that's just the hope for everybody um because at the end of the day, it really isn't real life because you don't see the things that you see on Twitter in real life. Like not really, right? Like people aren't as nasty right. in real life. And, you know, it was funny. It was a couple of years ago. My mom, my mom and me were talking and she was like, uh, oh, there's just so much hate out there. And I, I was like, where? And she was like, oh, it's everywhere. I was like, yeah, when was the last time you saw it? And she was like, oh, just because I don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'm like, yeah, understood. Like, don't you think you're seeing more of it so that influences your perception on what the world is versus what the world actually is to you when you go, you know, things like that. And I think or, that's... All- I see what she's saying a little bit, though, because, like, does that also not open up, like, your global perspective of what the fuck's actually going on in this world and not just in your little bubble of your life, though? Well... Yes, but you teeter on you teeter on actually tipping over and making your perception the things that you see yeah, okay, on yeah. social media, right? Because you don't see the things that gain the most traction are the are the most terrible things. Mm-hmm. And so if you see multiple instances of any sort of terrible thing online, I think you're more liable to believe that that actually exists in mass in real life and you're just lurking in the mists of it where in reality it's these things had always happened and probably happened more previous to present day but you are now exposed to it because more people are filming everything and so it not that it's not true because it's certainly true and like you can't discredit something that you've just seen right some video of somebody getting killed or what have you and and just the, whatever awful thing that you're exposed to online but i think it moreover i don't i don't believe that we're supposed to like take on the world's problems on our shoulders every day and i yeah. think we're we reckon with that with social media every every time that we log on and and so it's not that it's not true or that it's, it doesn't exist but it, it certainly exists in a greater presence in our mind now than it used to. Can you imagine what the world would have been like if social media was around during like World War One, two, during the civil rights movement, during like all, all these things that like probably were like very underreported, you know, like maybe we found out like after D-Day that, hey, like we took, we took the beach, at, uh, the beaches of Normandy and like we invaded, we, we made our, pro, our push and we won, we're victorious. But like, I, I wonder like, if like there was actually video footage that like CNN or whoever would have dropped that day with the exclusive video footage of like us storming the beaches, like how the world really would have felt about war. And, and like, you know, it's just really interesting to think about. It's like back then you could almost give like a jaded view of like the world and like inform people partially of what was really going on or, or like give a partial truth of like a story instead of now it's like, these are like, this is what happened. Here's a video of a police officer putting his knee on a dude's neck for nine minutes. Like I, you know what I mean? Like you can get real, real perspective on like what's going on. You know, like I know what you're saying where it's like not, you can't put the weight of all the problems on your shoulders. That like, yes, you're completely right. You got to handle like your environment, your people around you and, and like live your day to day as best you can. But it just makes me think like how different the world could have been back then if, if social media was a thing. Yeah. I think you're able to control the messaging so that you can interject propaganda as you see fit. And that's more or less, more or less what we we did during the war back then, right? We were not uh, completely innocent of demonizing our enemy or you know putting in any propaganda that we wanted to that supported the war effort. Um, but also, you know, back then, I yeah, I think back then it would have been a much bigger tool for good than it is today because i believe that the standards of society 
like across the board, particularly journalistic standards were much higher. And so I think that this tool, which has the power for so much more good than it does, I think would have done way more good back in, back in, in the day than it, than it has now. But also, I, I also think that, that there is a straight line correlation between the advent of social media and the popularity of it all to the de- like degradation of society, societal standards, particularly journalistic standards. So who knows, maybe back then it would have just been the same thing. And we, at this point would have been more accelerated in that. But if, if we were able to keep the high standards of society that we were fighting to protect overseas and implement those domestically through social media, yeah, I mean, I think 100% you have way more force for good than you do now. Because I think it was way worse back then domestically for a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons. But I think it was way worse of a time and you were able to get away with way more than than you are today because of the fact that you see everybody and you see everything and everyone's filming everything and there's cameras everywhere whether you know it or not and so yeah that, that's that is an interesting thought for sure well you would have been in my top five in my space here. <laughs> for sure appreciate sure. that i appreciate that yeah man have you, have you locked into uh myspace lately no, dude, I saw it. No, there's no way I know my password or anything. But I heard, I did see recently that you can look up a specific URL and pull up your MySpace if you can remember your exact username. Oh, I think I can. Really? <laughs> oh, we totally do that. That'd be hilarious. I think I can. Um, I don't know what my username was, man. It's probably like you said. I was like a character. I feel like on on MySpace back in those days. Like it was like you could be whatever you wanted. Like your parents weren't on it. You could just, like, dude. Great point. <laughs> <laughs> great point yes yeah. your parents weren't on it that had all that made all the difference in the world yeah yeah i mean you could really express yourself and i think that's what the initial like drive of social media users back in the day was is that you had the ability to connect with like-minded people particularly if you were in a, a youth because maybe you were misunderstood by everybody except your friends. And then you found an entire world of them online. Like, oh, how great of, of a thing is that? You know, like how cool is that? You can express yourself. You can be whatever you want, whoever you want, put up music that you like. Yeah, man. I remember having uh, profile songs, damn. All that, dude. And just conversations with absolute strangers all the time. Yeah. That was so much fun. It was exciting. You know, it was, you never knew who they were. You, especially if they didn't have like a profile picture or whatever, you know, you could be talking to whoever. That was cool. Yeah. God. <laughs> My mom had no idea. <laughs> My mom was pissed when she found out I had a MySpace, bro. Oh, she made really? in front of her. Yeah. She sat there and watched me delete the whole Damn, thing. For real. Hey, good for your mom. She was, mom was, she was, she was a hip lady back stuff. in the day. She made me wait till I was 13 to watch PG-13 movies, man. Like she was, <laughs> she had her rules for sure. Uh, you know, good or bad, who knows? It could have, it could have helped me out in the long run. From see, like you're kind of saying, like kids on social media when they're super young, like that could, that could be really bad on a developmental brain. And you know, who, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. I, I no, I, I, I think, I, I think the jury is not out on that at all. I think a hundred percent true that it's detrimental to children's brains particularly as developed as something like instagram is it it, it's it's not good there's no good really in it from a children's perspective go out there get in trouble break shit scrape your knees you know go be a friggin kid um while you have the opportunity to and while our society allows us to be you know allows our kids to be kids because yeah. you know it's it really is something that that you know we we could take for granted um and i'm i'm sure it's something that india is taking for granted um we have a we have a fun covid show coming up on wednesday and we have an, a guest that has not 1000% committed so i will uh, 
wait before I, I say their name, but I think we should touch on India a little bit because there was some news this weekend that came out of uh, India, particularly from the World Health Organization. And um, they, uh, they spotted a new variant and they're calling it a quote, variant of concern. Um, citing studies that show that it, it could be more transmissible than other variants. Um, it's known as, I don't know why they named it this, B.1.617 is the variant. Not, could we just call it like the Indian variant or something? Number but, two. <laughs> <laughs> the next one. They had to go through 616 of these before they got to B.1.617. Anyway, we're making fun of a disease. Um, yeah. The pattern, uh, the pattern is now one that uh, when one person gets it in the family, the whole family seems to get it, which is more or less what I think we saw over the past year and a half or so of COVID. Um, but uh, they're saying in India, it's not like the first wave, and what they're seeing, they believe, is far more transmissible. Uh, trans transmissible, excuse me. Um, so like that's the thing about this disease this virus like so just this one here b.1.617 that has had 13 different mutations just that one variant of this coronavirus so i know i get a little bit hot under the collar when i see people particularly those in positions of power spell a air of caution or even danger and despair over coronavirus. I don't like it. But if you're dealing with all of these variants, I could, as a scientist, I could understand how you get to that point. Well, especially in this country where you have a worse healthcare system by far than us and three times the people. Oh, yeah. You know, what I haven't, under, what I don't understand is how the, how has, have they not gone into a full lockdown at this point? Like there is a very serious problem. It sounds like from everything we've been hearing over the last ten days plus. How do you not just say do what they did in Europe and be like, hey, until we can get a hold of this thing and 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 really understand how many variants and whatever we're dealing with, like stay in your fucking house. We're shutting down. Like we <laughs> we need to like limit as many people coming into hospitals as as possible. You know, I I don't understand how they're. I don't even know what would be president or, or leader, how, how, they, how that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. Um, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of conflicting data on lockdowns on whether or not they even help, whether or not they even do what they're intended to do. Um, there was a study that came out last week and the, the record of States in America that locked down heavily versus the record of states in America that didn't or were locked down for less time are almost equal. Hmm. Meaning the same amount of people percentage-wise got affected, the same amount of people died. And but I would got to spread more. I mean, common sense would just tell you that, it, that if this is actually, like if COVID is a real virus, like any virus, like the flu, it, it would be easier to spread when normal proceedings are going on than if you're confined to your house, you know, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I'd want to see that. It, uh, yeah. So it, it, it would. And I think everybody accepted that during the beginning of this, right? Mm -hmm. If we take these precautions, we'll slow the spread, this, that, and the other. But if you can't do that forever, yeah. Particularly in a country like America where people are very belligerent about their rights, then more or less what you're trying to do is just control the spread, make it so that, you know, this group of people doesn't get it versus this group of people and, and you could do, you know, you could do things like that. Um, but unless you're talking about like you said, fully shutting everything down and making sure that your people are taken care of as as if they didn't, as if they weren't shut down, then I'm, I'm all for it. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna bring up the rear and allow these people to maintain their 
they're living as this goes on, then cool. But I think it seemed, at least from our perspective, that was an impossibility. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's tricky. If, if people aren't scared of it, should they have the right to do what they want to do? Yeah, that could they have the right to assume that risk. You know, I think you get into way more things like that. And fuck, yeah. Yeah, India, how many? It's like what one point two billion something. I don't know. A ton of people in that country. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's hard. And yeah, if you go into a full lockdown, cool. That helps it for maybe a week. But like, how long can you? I guess fully stay locked down before your economy just blows the fuck up. Yeah. No. So. Right. A hundred percent. Um. So it looks like the jury's still out on on lockdowns and their effectiveness, but also it, it would be the same story if you were like, um, like you said, wouldn't it have gotten worse had the restrictions been more stringent? And it's kind of like, yeah, we'll really never know because we're only going to know what we did and everything else is going to be hearsay. Everything else is going to be kind of like, well, maybe we'll throw the dart on the dartboard and hope it, hope it hits a bullseye, but we don't, we just don't know. Um, but anyway, India is, uh, again, not, not showing much signs of progress. And um, hmm. yeah, so it's, uh, it's a big concern. And, and that variant uh, might rear its ugly head here shortly. We shall see. Did you uh, see the Doge father on Saturday Night Live on Saturday? I did. I did. He was passable. I was, he actually, yeah, he did pretty good. Like for what I, especially now knowing that he has Asperger's, I never knew that before. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. He cried. Yeah. I thought he did pretty well. Like Saturday Night Live has just sucked for a long time to me though. Like I, I don't think that was just like, I don't think Elon was going to save it or anything. Like it was, it was yeah. the writing is just that they just don't have the same kind of talent they used to have for, if that's, you know, like a PC thing where they can't get guys, you know, that can really go out there and, and, I don't know. I just think restrictions were a little looser back in like 70s, 80s, 90s, where you could have guys like, you know, Chris Farley and Adam Sandler and these guys. Maybe they were just funnier in general, but I feel like it's a little easier to do a nationally broadcasted comedy show back then, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like a Norm MacDonald weekend update. Yeah. I if, forgot he did that. If you wow. want to piss your pants, just YouTube Norm MacDonald weekend update and watch his weekend updates. They're He's the best. He's the best to ever do that segment for sure. Man, I would forgot he did that. Holy shit. Well, yeah, there's a whole 10 minute segment of him on YouTube just shitting on Hillary Clinton. <laughs> it's <laughs> unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And this is in the 90s. It's fantastic. Anyway. Well, the self-proclaimed Doge father went on to Saturday Night Live this weekend and the price of Doge dogecoin fell off a cliff my friend i and my brother and many friends of mine lost a decent amount of money this during just during that show during that hour and a half it went and fell 30 percent basically in an hour and a half which is that is volatility at its finest <laughs> mm -hmm. no, um kidding. as of today it, it's continued to drop down to like right now it's sitting at 44 as i watch the ticker Oh, wow. Um, but oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So it all, it seemed to kind of really drop when he, he was on Weekend Update and he like played this this character. Um, and he like, they kept asking him like, what's Dogecoin? And he like kept giving an answer, but like not answering it. And then they'd ask him, what's Dogecoin? Like that was like the joke. Uh -huh. and, and it like ultimately ended up with him saying it's a hustle. And as soon as he said that, bro, it fell out. Like it dipped immediately. Um, which cool. I'm super like I know he's probably just trying to be funny, but like as the self proclaimed Doge father and and as this guy that's been pumping this thing for for months now, I don't know why you'd go on there and do anything else but boost it, unless well, his his idea was to like let's put some doubt into this thing so like it can dip and I can buy a shit ton more real quick. <laughs> I mean, maybe I don't know, but it he's. I think he's just telling the truth. <laughs> it yeah, is yeah, a man. hustle. I mean, like if, you, if you're surprised by that statement, then I I can't help you. I I I, I understand why it dipped, but 
if you were participating in this phenomenon and you didn't know it was a hustle and then you expected your your lord and savior elon to come out there and just push it up i mean i guess it was trending in that way right i i think a lot of people had that very same thought he's going to come on there he's going to say something cool about dogecoin and it's just going to go through the roof um but he kind of back i mean i would say backtrack but he he literally offered to let people pay to go to the moon in dogecoin which is i mean that's cool you know i yeah. and and uh i i don't know i i think I think the uh, hype of Dogecoin is going to allow it to actually have some sort of bearing to, gr- to, you know, flash some sort of fangs in this crypto market, which everybody should know that cryptocurrency is now worth more than all U.S. currency in circulation. Wow. And uh, all that means to me is it's a big, giant bubble. So watch out. Yeah, Tune yeah, but going into the episode, Sorry, uh, and as, just as the episode started, uh, Doge was trading for seventy cents, and mm. by the time it ended, it had fallen to I think it was forty nine cents, and now it's even dropped even more. Mm. So he, uh, I'm very curious if that's like what he meant to do or not. But another kind of thing that I, I drew from the story that I think is very interesting because it's not the first time it's happened is uh, during like this quick sell off while the, all this chaos was going on uh mysteriously robin hood just stopped working and it blocked your ability to buy or sell the crypto and this is not the first time this has happened mm-hmm. it has happened for months now as as all this doge madness as, as it has come from a joke to a reality it's gone from less than a penny to almost a dollar it got up to 74 cents dude like that's that's insane yeah uh, but i think it's a really big problem that that conveniently during these periods robin hood can just be like oh like oh no 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 we're stopping it that's that's not good especially and they've been taking a lot of heat for this but especially because the the main companies that that fund them their main investors uh which is sequoia capital and d1 capital are especially d1 are companies that make a large amount of money from shorting stocks so it is in robin hood's interest to protect these people because they fund them you know, essentially. Uh, and just for reference, to put some numbers behind that, in January 2021, when the GameStop short was going on and Reddit was taking over, uh, D1 lost $4 billion in the course of a month, 20% of its total capital. So it is in their interest for, for Robinhood to pause and halt these tradings so that they can go and do whatever they need to behind the scenes to secure their investment back or whatever they're doing and then you know allow this to happen. And that's not ethical in any way when you pitch Robin Hood as the trader for the normal everyday person like us. Yeah, I could I could see how it it would it would come across as a very um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like like yeah, like they're covering their ass. Like it's a like it's a very um, short sighted yeah. move, very malicious, and I think the obvious thing to look at is oh wow these people are backed by these people and you know they're trying to manipulate their funds here's how i think it it goes down if you're robin hood and you have so many millions of people trading on your platform for free right they pay zero to do it you and i pay zero money to do it right you have so many people doing it and something catches a wave like GameStop or like a giant sell-off of Dogecoin at one time. It's not like these, it's not like this company has cash reserves, right? So like if however many million of people decided to sell at one time their entire stake in Dogecoin, it's not like a one-for-one transaction it's they need to have the money the capital to make sure that they can do what the people are trying to do and if they can't then the worst thing that can happen is somebody tries to trade at a price that they want to trade for and they can't do it because they don't have the ability to facilitate that transaction 
So I think what they're doing is they're saying, whoa, 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 way too much action at one time. We need to make sure that this is actually something that we can facilitate because if we can't, then, then there's going to be no trust in our platform. So we have to make sure that we can facilitate these trades. I'm sure that there is some benefit for the people who would be losing money on Robin Hood's actions to do this. But I think that they're operating in good faith. And I think that it's just an unfortunate consequence of the mass amount of trading that you're seeing because of Robin Hood and because of these crypto runs and because of Reddit and things like that. I mean, this isn't something that is baked into the pie when you're trying to formulate a trading platform because it goes against all logic of trading almost ever. So yeah. I, I think I, I think it's a little bit less of a bad faith action, but it's certainly not a good look. Yeah. Well, just just some other little tidbits here before we go. It, it was funny watching the show because uh, Tesla like never uh, advertises on TV, which is really interesting, but they never do. Um, but during Saturday Night Live, uh, Lucid Ford and Volkswagen all ran ads for their electric vehicles. So they <laughs> targeting that Tesla for sure. Oh, that's uh, funny. And and kind of in response to all this chaos and, and like that that his appearance caused in the crash. Uh, the next day on Sunday, Space uh, Musk announced that uh, SpaceX is going to launch the Doge One mission to the moon uh, in the first quarter of next year. They're saying like uh, sometime in like January, February of 2022, uh, and it is going to be a the very first rocket that's set up to the moon to like study it and and get data that's going to be fully paid for by Doge. So it, it's going to be through SpaceX that that is it's being paid for by a company called geometric energy corporation and and spacex is going to be allow them to pay them completely in doge to do this so there will literally be a literal doge coin on the literal moon as mr musk product per uh as he called out many i think it was a couple weeks ago he said that so it is going to happen so that's interesting come hell or high water doge is going to the moon (laughs) i hope you guys all get rich um (sighs) we'll see but uh, yeah, I think we are up against it here, sir. Yeah, as always, you can find us. We try to post all the links to everything we kind of talk about so you can kind of see where we're drawing our references from. Uh, we post those up all on our Twitter. That's Friendship NH. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Friendship News Hour and Facebook as well. Um, and as always, you can send us an email, any questions, comments, concerns at bummerdude.media at gmail.com. We'll be sure to answer you. Um, and once again, thank you to Gun Barrel Coffee for sponsoring the podcast. Very appreciative to have them on board. And you'll be hearing us talk about them for some time now. So Yeah, and we'll be on Instagram Kids here coming soon in the following <laughs> months. You can find us on Instagram for your children. <laughs> All right. Till, uh, till Wednesday, everybody. We'll see you. Bye. <laughs> that was a great way to end.